Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, Ramiumptum Ruminations. My name is Scott, and I'm the host. Today's very special episode is called A Faith Crisis at BYU-Idaho Admissions with Brady Nordfeldt. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, Ramiumptum Ruminations. I have a very special guest today who I'll bring out of the green room in just a minute here. We brought his wife on the, onto the podcast a couple months back. She told me a little bit about his background and I reached out to him as well. So we finally have Erica Nordfeldt's husband, Brady, on the show to talk about his time working at BYU-Idaho in the admissions department for the 11 years that he spent working at BYU Idaho. So without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Brady. All right. Thanks for having me, Scott. Excited to be here. And uh, you introduced me perfectly, Erica's husband. <laughs> That's how I like to be known. I mean, let me just first say my wife is one of the most incredible human beings that I have had the privilege of knowing on this earth. And I would gladly stand in the shadow of her brilliance any day. Not that she requires that of me by any means, but um, she's a bright light in this world, and I'm just happy to be on the journey with her. Yeah, she was an amazing guest, and and the reason I presented it like that is because she was on the show first, and she introduced me to you through that. So. That's, that's how I like it. <laughs> Let's do a, a quick refresh on your life. When I talked to her, she kind of focused on her growing up a little bit, and then she talked a little bit about the faith crisis that you guys went through, but we didn't go too much into those details. So yeah as much or as little as you'd like to share about your background, we can we can start diving right into this before we get into the bulk where we'll talk about yeah. <laughs> working for BYU-Idaho. For sure, for sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I was raised um, in the church, both parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. In fact, my, my dad always kind of says that, so on my mom's side, we're related directly to the f the first wife. They like to pick, point that out of uh, Brigham Young, um, and on my dad's side, to the guy who baptized Brigham Young. So you know, very old pioneer stock and heritage and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, so very classic traditional Mormon upbringing. I wouldn't say like you know ultra orthodox kind of thing, but but pretty pretty. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like an average, like an average or a normal LDS experience, not not too extreme, not too lax, just kind of right in the middle. Yeah, your normal average LDS experience. Yeah, so um, I was raised in the Air Force. My dad was um, uh, in the Air Force. We moved around a lot, so I I wasn't raised kind of in the your typical maybe what you'd call bubble of Utah or Idaho or anything like that. I was born in Colorado. Um, moved and we lived in Texas and Alabama and Germany and Montana and all these different places. In fact, I was baptized in Germany and they didn't have a font or anything. So I was baptized at the local swimming pool. And because it was an active swimming pool, I was baptized at like five in the morning because we had to go before it opened. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have a white outfit for me. So I was baptized in a karate suit. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So that was unique. Growing up in the church, did you, you know, check all the boxes that you were supposed to check, you know, seminary, mission, all those, that sort of things? Yeah, luckily we hit, my dad had retired and we moved to Rexburg, Idaho um, when I was starting seminary. So I didn't have to attend early morning seminary, <laughs> lucky for me. But um, yeah, I went to seminary, um, graduated and started school at uh, Rick's College at the time, and then went on a mission to uh, Sydney, Australia. Um, and while I was gone, Rick's turned into BYU, Idaho, but yeah, served a, a mission in Australia and it was fantastic to, to go to Australia. My entire district in the MTC went to Oklahoma, but me, so <laughs> I rubbed it in their face as much as possible. I, I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> Came home, started school back at BYU, Idaho, met Erica, got married in the temple, all that, you know, the classic steps and things like that for sure. 
So at what point would you say in your life were you, do you feel like you were starting to question things or maybe it wasn't lining up or was that when you were already working in your career at BYU-Idaho? So that's a good question because I think, I think all of us, even members that are currently in the church probably have times where they can look back and be like, well, you know, I kind of had a, a moment of questioning and things like that. I remember specifically one major one for me was when I was on my mission. And um, I, I hate to say this because it's so cliche, but I, I was the AP. I was the AP for a little while on my mission. And my mission president heard me teach the first discussion one time. And he was like, so blown away by it. He was just like, we are going to, you are going to come with me and we're going to travel the entire mission and visit every single zone. And you're going to teach everybody how to teach the first discussion. And I was like, you know, I was so excited and I was just like, oh, you know, he likes me so much and all this kind of stuff. Timeline wise, was this before the preach my gospel then? Yes. Before preach my gospel. So this would have been like three or four, maybe five years before preach my gospel. Yeah, actually, I think it was like two or three. So it was 2000. Yeah, 2000 was when I left, came back 2002. So so I went around and was teaching, you know, and I remember specifically one point, like it was this whole like zone conference. There's all these missionaries and I was up at the front and I was going through this whole how I teach the, you know, the first discussion. And we were getting to the first vision. And in the middle of it, I just had this thought, I am totally manipulating the situation right now. Like (laughs) the way it's, it's really, it's just me. And it's because I slow things down and the way I word things and the way I point out certain things. And I was like, I'm the one that's causing this like hush to the crowd and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, wait, that shouldn't be right, right? This should be the spirit. It's not like me. And so I had this moment of like, really like wondering what was happening there. And I was able to just kind of be like, well, maybe that's how the spirit works. And just, you know, just throw it on the shelf and stuff like that. So you're recognizing that the speaker has the ability to influence how the listener is receiving the content that you're giving them, whether or not that influences what's actually being said. Exactly. I don't, I don't know. There's a, I forget what the title of it is, but there's a Ted talk where it's a Ted talk about nothing. I don't know if you've seen it. I've seen it. And uh, there's the point where he's like, these glasses, they don't have anything in them. And like, he goes through, <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, go ahead. he's not, he's not saying anything. <laughs> the inflection is hilarious. He's literally saying nothing, but he's using the inflection of a good public speaker to say nothing. And you almost feel the emotions as he's saying it. And it's, it's wild because he's literally just describing what he's doing the entire time. And now I'm going to slow it down and I'm going to just, you know, and he, like, he's not saying anything, <laughs> but you're totally, you're totally in, caught up in all the, like, what's going on. And so I, like, later on, I saw that many years later, but I was like, oh my gosh, like, that's, that's what I was doing. <laughs> and I, and you see it, it all the time as well. Like, you know, I, I got my master's degree in English and love reading and um, love writing. In fact, I kind of really like public speaking as well. You know, stories are what really captivate all of us. And you can just like, you can see it in a, in a sacrament meeting when everybody's as bored as can be, you know, and then one person starts on a personal story and you see people's heads come up. And they're like, oh, <laughs> they're, they're caught into the moment of the story. And like, and someone who can present a really good story and can just use inflection and, and pacing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, it can really captivate you that way. It's, it's interesting you mentioned English because that's, uh, I studied English as well. And it has largely influenced the way that I view the church. And I, it was, it took a while to, to connect the dots there, the tools to, for literary criticism that you learn in English. It took me a minute to actually apply those to the scriptures and apply those to religion. But the minute I did, everything just came kind of crashing down. Uh, not related at all, but uh, let's see, your favorite living author and your favorite deceased author. What have you got? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I, you know, and I love asking people this exact same question, but it's, it's so hard to answer. Oh, of I can, course. I can give you a few. Cool. Um, and this is, oh, I hate, I hate saying this. Living author, I'm going to say a, a person, you probably have never heard of him, uh, Haruki Murakami. And I, I, I hesitate always telling people that he's my favorite author because his books are very, different and weird. I don't know if you've ever heard of the genre uh, magic realism. I have heard of the genre, but I've never heard of this author. I quickly Googled him because just because I'm curious now. <laughs> so he he's mostly kind of a magic realism. And if, if you don't know, I mean, for magic realism, I like to describe it as people always like, what is magic realism? It's very hard to define. But if you've ever watched the movie La La Land, right, you have that one scene where they're at like the Griffin observatory and they start to dance and they, and they float, right? Everything else in the movie besides them singing is, is real life. It's normal, but them floating is magic. So it's a magic element in realism and good magic realism typically represents something else happening. You know, in that moment they're falling in love. And so they feel weightless and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, Haruki Murakami, it's very bizarre books that have really weird stuff going on but i just i just really love him he's a japanese author i'll have to check him out yeah definitely one of my living favorites um i would say on as well tim o'brien wrote the things they carried which is i mean one of the most phenomenal books people always are like what is that book about and i say uh vietnam but to say vietnam is like saying i don't know that like yeah, it's hard to describe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's you're like making me think back to like 15 years ago when I read this, but it's like it's set in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. But there's the the emotions in that book are profound and like so much broader than the Vietnam War. Anyway, for sure, yeah. Uh, dead authors, I re- I really love one of my favorite all time favorite books is The Great Gatsby, just because of how like poetic and beautiful that book is. I really like um, East of Eden, Steinbeck. So those are two off the top of my head. I mean, there's obviously a, a million more. <laughs> <laughs> English and reading um, literature, that's all a huge passion of mine. So that's why. We could just have our own podcast talking about that stuff. Oh, that's right. And, we should. <laughs> and, and Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut is definitely one of my favorites. So He's one that I've, I haven't read anything of his yet, but it's one of those, you know, those authors that's, it's like always in the background people recommend. And I'm, I just, I haven't made the time yet. So slaughterhouse five is, uh, it'll blow you away. So, well, let's, I, you know, if you're ready, we can bring this back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said you studied English. You went to Rick's before your mission. Did you come back to BYU Idaho then, or did you go to? Yeah. So I came back, uh, went to, it would change to BYU Idaho while I was on my mission. Um, I, my bachelor's degree was in outdoor recreational leadership, um, which is how I actually met Erica. We actually met rock climbing uh, one day and then we were in a class together that next semester, an outdoor class. And we both, she was a rec major. I was a rec major. We love the outdoors and you know, the rest is history as they say. So then your master's degree, where did you guys go to, to study? Yeah, so after we graduated, I, since I stopped Erica from going on a mission, which she really wanted to do, <laughs> I promised her we would do something cool. And so we went uh, and lived in China, taught English for six months. And um, then we came back and we went to, I went to Colorado State University to get my master's in Fort Collins. And she did hers online through Adams State. How... Did you get involved with BYU Idaho then? Doesn't seem like a typical career path. I mean, yeah. <laughs> how how do you get from studying English to working in the admissions department within BYU Idaho? Help me make that connection. <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, in the eleven years working at BYU Idaho, I have so many college kids come into my office and just be like, you know, what what should I do? I'm thinking about this, and I'd be like, look. I thought I wanted to be like a rock climbing guide in the Tetons. (laughs) Got a degree in outdoor rec, realized I'd never support a family doing that. So then I was like, oh, I'll make lots more being an English teacher. (laughs) (laughs) And went and got my master's in English. And during my um, 
when I was student teaching and all that kind of stuff, I was just like, this, uh, I don't know if this is for me, you know? And so I decided not to be a teacher and became a manager of an outdoor store in Colorado, making more than I would as a teacher, <laughs> mind you. That was, that was my experience as well. English ed and then realized I wasn't going to make any money and switched careers. So. So while I was uh, the manager, and I was just the manager of the camping department within this store, and I was still making more as a teacher. Oh, wow. And I, uh, during that whole year and a half or so, as I was a manager, I was looking for jobs. And Eric and I kind of discussed, you know, well, I mean, we liked BYU-Idaho. They tend to have a lot of just, you know, administrative jobs opening here and there. So I applied for some there and uh, ended up getting one of the jobs. So moved up and we were so super excited to have a finally a career and be able to buy a house and things like that within the admissions department that's where you you got this this career what were what was your role and what were some of the duties and and such that you were over or that you managed yeah so there was about it, it kind of fluctuated but anywhere around nine of us that were kind of administrators in the office and all of us all of us shared responsibilities uh, as far as reading applications um, and out kind of promoting the university. We would, we would have like geographical locations and different schools that we were in charge of communicating with, you know, the high school um, career centers or guidance counselors and things like that. Um, And so we all, we traveled a lot and did presentations and, We would travel with uh, BYU, BYU Hawaii, uh, LDSBC at the time, and then us. And we would do uh, giant firesides all throughout the country where we'd invite like four or five stakes at one central location. And we'd just, you know, sometimes you'd get up to like 800 people, you know, all the way back to the stage, just all. And we'd do these big presentations. So all of us shared in those responsibilities. But then outside of that, my specific responsibility for the 11 years I was there was um, visual media was kind of like what I was the visual media specialist, whatever you want to call it. So at the time, this would have been like early internet. So are you doing like videos for the internet or is it like strictly TV radio when you started? So it was, yeah, internet stuff. So YouTube videos, we didn't do a whole lot of those, but anything a prospective student would see, I was in charge of. So brochures, um, uh, videos, pamphlets, uh, social media. I was actually in charge of the admissions website as well. Um, And so all of that kind of stuff. And not that I specifically produced any of that kind of stuff, but I was the project manager over all of it. And then we'd have Uh, we would work with another organization on campus called um, University Relations. And they're like the PR kind of branding people. And I would work with them and we'd have students who would make all these things and I would just be the project manager. Side note, my wife and I went to BYU-Idaho. That's where we met. And uh, and I actually worked full-time on my off semesters on campus as well in the faculty training department. We probably never bumped shoulders because it was a totally different side of the of the school. But I helped. Yeah, but we probably know similar people. Yeah, I helped the professors build their online courses. So, like when I was there, that's when they were migrating to online for just about everything. I'm sure they're using a whole different tool now, but um, they don't progress very often. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would basically go to like a different professor every day and help them put all their material onto their, their iLearn yeah, yeah. You know, course that they were doing. You're working there for 11 years. Let's stick a little bit on um, maybe the personal side of the story before we jump too much into kind of the, the day-to-day and some of the, the details of working there. At what point while you're working there, did you start to deconstruct your faith? And what was that like? Yeah, so, I mean... Let me back up just a little bit too. Um, I remember before I started officially working there and I was in Colorado and I was telling people oh, I've been hired and all this kind of stuff. We were moving up there and you would not believe how many people I heard the phrase, well, you're going to have to have a really strong testimony to work for the church. <laughs> 
I heard it from both my parents because both my parents worked for the church. My mom worked at BYU Idaho, and my dad was a facility manager, and he managed, I mean, tons and tons of church buildings. Um, but I heard it from other people in my ward who had worked for the church and all of these things. Yeah, because you're in Rexburg. A lot of these people work at the campus, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, like all the time. And, you know, I look back on it, and it's really kind of comical to me, like, what I was hearing from these people. Because really, what I think that they were saying was, is like, you're going to like question maybe your testimony and things like that. You're going to see how leaders lead and how maybe women are treated in the, in the church and how the priesthood is manipulated in the work setting. And it's going to make you question things. And I think, you know, maybe another way they were saying is you, you might have to do some mental gymnastics to kind of get around some of this stuff. And, and you need to make sure that you're, you know, that those those shelves that you have are like rooted into some studs and you're not just using, (laughs) you're not using a drywall screw or something like that, you know, (laughs) which is funny because I heard the exact same thing before I started reading uh, rough stone rolling Um, from a couple of people, people would see me reading it and they're like, well, you better have a strong testimony. And I mean, what they're saying is like, you're going to have to, you're going to do some gymnastics. You're going to put some stuff on shelf, make sure it's secure. And to be honest, I couldn't even finish the book. <laughs> <because> <laughs> yeah, that was my experience with that one as well. My shelf started to like lean a little forward. Apparently, I was using drywall screws. <laughs> Going back to your original question, which was, what was it again? <laughs> How your religious deconstruction played out while you were working for the, the church. For many years, it wasn't really much of anything. Like, I, I feel like I'm... I always felt like a bit of an outsider at BYU Idaho. In the church, I never really felt that way, but at BYU Idaho, where Mormonism is very like concentrated, and it's like all you're seeing the whole time working for an organization like that is the people who move up are like your cookie cutter, and it's like the person who wears a suit every day to work, white shirt. And in that kind of stuff, then I never really fit that mold. And so that kind of annoyed me a little bit, but wasn't necessarily like me deconstructing my faith that way. Um, But there were things that really started kind of um, getting to me over time. I I mean, the, the whole honor code really... It didn't like shake my faith or anything like that, but it was one of those things where it's just like, I don't think anybody has any clue what the point of this thing is. <laughs> it's more strict at BYU Idaho than it is at BYU, and so are, is that the is that what you're noticing? Or help me help me understand what about the honor code was was uh, making you think like this? Yeah, so <laughs> you have well, here's an example. So we had at one point. A girl who worked for me was also on, I don't even know what they call it there, like the student council or whatever, right? And she was like, I know your opinions on the (laughs) the dress and grooming standards. (laughs) And the student council really wants to do a survey of the students and professors about what they think about the honor code. And specifically the dress and grooming standards, not necessarily the honor code. And she's like, I know you're a smart guy. So why don't you meet with them and help them out? And I was like, okay. (laughs) I met with them and helped them formulate some questions to do this survey and all that kind of stuff. And they sent out a survey to like every student and every uh, admin and faculty on campus. And I, they shared with me the results of this thing. And I would say looking at it, it was probably like 90% of the students were like, it needs revamping, makes no sense whatsoever, that why are we different than the other schools? Why do we have rules that don't even apply to the temple? Are we like more of a sacred place than the (laughs) temple? And it, it just, none of it made sense to them. And then I looked at the results from faculty and staff and it was almost the same thing. It was like 80 something percent of them. And I, I remember looking at some of them and they were like, I am currently, I work on campus. I'm also a bishop to a student ward. This doesn't make sense. I have a problem explaining it to the students and like all of this <laughs> stuff. 
And so I was like, oh, wow. I mean, they got some really good information here. And I didn't hear anything from them for a little while. And then I, I contacted one of them. I was like, so wait, what happened with that whole survey? And they were like, well, we went into President's Council and we were like, hey, we, we did a survey about the dress and grooming standards. And apparently, President Iring was like, I'm going to stop you right there. I don't want to hear anything about it. <laughs> and that was the end. <laughs> and so, I, you know, here's how I always worded it to people. It's you have all of these people on campus who work there who try to give you reasons for why it is what it is, right? I, I've heard, well... We can't be the same as Hawaii because we live in a place where it's really cold. But it's also very hot in the yes. summer. You it don't... also gets probably hotter here than it does in Hawaii during the summer. Yeah. So that makes no sense. Weeks of 100 plus days for those for the kids that are on the summer semester. Yeah. And and for people who don't know, like one of the things that's different from us to say BYU is you can't wear shorts, right? And you can't wear capris. Or, yeah, you, they have to have a, a heel strap. But you can wear a skirt that goes to your knees, but you can't wear shorts. Like, uh, that makes no sense. <laughs> and why can BYU have shorts and capris and you can't have them at BYU-Idaho? And so I always explained it like this. Like, there's the difference between a principal and uh, what is what am I looking for here? I have it, like, written down. I like a doctrine and a principal? Yeah. Oh, principles and values, right? So, um, a principle, well, so let's say a value is something that you personally have as a value, right? And that varies from person to person, right? And you can teach values to your yourself and your own kids, and that's totally fine. But once you try to pass values on to somebody else, it gets a little hard. Now, principles are, I'm doing air quotes here, are unchangeable truths. Now, in the church, you can have these principles that they would say are unchangeable truths, and those still can vary from person to person, what you believe is true or not, of course, right? From profit but, to profit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to have the honor code along the lines of a principle in the church, you could teach it, and it would make more sense to people. So if you were to say, well, we're trying to prepare all of the, the people, all the students who attend BYU-Idaho, for temple endowment, right? Because that's something that they want everybody to have, right? And when you enter the temple, you have to wear garments. So we just want you to wear clothes that would cover a garment. And like you can say that to a student. Every student would be like, okay, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Makes sense. But then you'd have to get, allow them to wear shorts and you'd have to allow them to have beards, you know? But otherwise you get into this whole value thing and it's it's it doesn't make any sense to anybody because it's not their values that beards are unprofessional or whatever it is. Let's transition back a little bit. No, I, this was great. This was great. <laughs> I am the king of tangents. Sorry. <laughs> I think that was amazing, and I think the listeners are going to love it. But let's let's get back to you deconstructing your faith a little bit, and then leading to you uh, terminating your employment over there, or or why did you leave, and and what led up to you not working for BYU Idaho anymore. Yeah, so as I mentioned like I was reading Rough Stone Rolling and some things kind of came out in that that really kind of um started to like make me wonder. I I started I read that section on his his stone that he found, you know. And I I remember like I just stopped and I was like, "Wait. I don't think I've ever heard of this stone before." Especially that, like, other people were using something very similar in the same time frame as this, like, peep stone kind of thing, right? And so I kind of shut the book and I was like, I can't keep going. Like, this is like shaking my faith too much. And I remember it was like several months later. And at the time, I saw it as like a miracle or like a sign from God. I was reading East of Eden by John Steinbeck. And one of the characters in there is known for being able to find water. Yeah, he's a, a dousing rod to find water. Dousing rod, right? And he even says, I think I have the quote. I have this book that I I carry with me pretty much everywhere I go, right? And it's got all these sections in it. I collect quotes in it and all that kind of stuff. And That's very cool. I, have, I think I have it here. Yeah, he says, maybe it's the way... Oh, sorry. Maybe I know where the water is and I feel it in my skin, 
Some people have a gift in this direction or that. Suppose, well, I call it humility or a deep disbelief in myself forces me to do the magic to bring up the, up to the surface the thing I know anyway. And so he's basically saying, I don't have enough faith in myself, so I have to use this stick to find the water, right? And I was like, oh, that's it. Joseph Smith didn't have enough faith in himself, so he had to have some sort of object in order to you know, translate the scriptures. Yeah, to concentrate his faith or whatever. Yeah, that uh, that allowed me to like anchor into another drywall screw. Interesting. <laughs> but over time, I as I learned more and more about that kind of story, that kind of was a little bit more of a deconstruction for me. What else? I'm trying to think of other things. I I remember one time I was I was actually at work and I was reading this article from Dan Airely, I think is what his name is. And it was this thing about ego depletion. Have you ever heard of ego depletion? I haven't. That's not a term I'm familiar with. So it's the idea that like in certain situations, your ability to make decisions is is hampered. Um, and there's lots of studies that show how this happens. And one of them was um, they had this suspension bridge that was known as like this really long, one of the biggest ones in the world suspension bridge. And it's really wobbly and insecure. And they would have a person standing in the middle of the suspension bridge with a, a clipboard, right? And they would stop. It was a male and they would stop all these women and they would say, Hey, can you take this survey? And it would be a very simple survey. But after the end of the survey, the man would start to hit on them and ask them for their number and their information. So they did that on the suspension bridge, and then they did the exact same thing on a regular like walking bridge. I can't remember what it was, but let's say it's like the Golden Gate Bridge. Very secure, lots of, you know, it's you have no threat of I- any danger or anything like that. You're not swaying in the wind. <laughs> yeah, you're not swaying. <laughs> and it was like significantly higher. They were willing to give out their information on the suspension bridge because of this, the stressful situations that they might have been in compared to the other, right? And I remember like reading that and I was thinking to myself, man, I can't trust my brain, can I? I have, like, I have no idea what's going on any moment of any day. And I, the church, I was raised in this from a little kid. And so everything I was fed over and over and over again like my mind could be playing tricks on me right now. What I think is the spirit might just be me and my thoughts. And, and so that led me down this whole path of like, really just psychology in general of how your brain can play tricks on you. And that, that was another thing that started to make me question a lot of different things. And it kind of just ended up snowballing from there. So how long did you continue to work in the admissions department after having started this or like moving through this, this faith crisis and, and I guess which things did you stop believing in, believing in and what was that like continuing to engage with other members of the church? I don't feel like I officially let go or when I officially kind of let go of everything, I only worked for an additional maybe year tops. Um, I had a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, a lot of things that I just pushed off to the side and just said, man, that's for, that's for a later date for sure. But it wasn't until kind of right before COVID, I, the, the Bishop of our wards was released and soon thereafter left the church. Oh oh no. (laughs) And I, I knew him really well. He was he worked at BYU Idaho as well and my Eric and I went on a a double date with he and his wife and went out to dinner one time and we were just talking to him about stuff and uh I remember all of the things he was saying were things that I had recently started to kind of come across through podcasts and reading and all that kind of stuff. And as we were driving home I I said to Erica, I was like, wow, that was really interesting. What did you think? And she was like, yeah, that was, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know. And <laughs> I, I said to her, and this was the first time I'd ever voiced anything to Erica about my doubts. And I said, I just want you to know that I have a lot of similar thoughts and beliefs that he was mentioning at that dinner. And she looked at me and she goes, 
me too. And I mean, first of all, what a giant relief that we were both going through this at the exact same time. Um, Cause I mean, I, Erica as a therapist has dealt with lots of couples who aren't going through it at the same time. And that's really rough on a lot of marriages. Well, and, and just the bravery to, to broach that subject. I mean, there's, there's so many unspoken agreements in an LDS couple. And, and one of them is that you're supposed to be part of the faith for the rest of your life. And to even for you to even say, Hey, I'm doubting is a huge risk to the relationship. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, and I, I was super nervous. I, I, I think though that I had a little bit of an inclination to where she was as far as just mine, ten, my kind of stuff tended to always come back to more of like historical doctrinal kind of stuff. And then secondary was the culture of the church. I was able to look at the culture and just be like, ah, those are all just people being people, you know, <laughs> but hers was, the opposite, where it was a lot of the cultural stuff, and then secondary was that kind of historical doctrinal stuff. And having heard her voice, her opinion on the cultural stuff, I kind of had a sense that she was somewhere, right? And so, but I, I was really nervous to say anything. But, but really, that kicked off like a whole year of her and I constantly talking about stuff. It was, you know, and it was during COVID. And so we were having home church. We have um, a yurt. Do you know what a yurt is? Yeah, yeah. We, my wife and I go camping in, in yurts occasionally on the Oregon coast. Nice. Yeah, we have a yurt in our backyard. Long story as to why. Oh, very cool. <laughs> yeah. Long story as to why we have one. But we would have <laughs> church every Sunday in our yurt. And we called it yurt. We called it yurt. <laughs> but. Every time, like as this things as things started to progress between me and Eric and our discussions, and we were like, we would start to have our own lessons kind of off the beaten path of come follow me. And after church, the kids would all run back into the house to go, you know, have screen time or whatever. And Eric and I would always st- stay and we'd have these long conversations about, well, how did you feel how that went? What are you feeling about things right now? How are you feeling about the church? What do you want to do? And we ebbed and flowed from like, we're going to gung ho. We're going to like stick it out. We're just going to be nuanced to like, I don't know how much I can take of this. Yeah. And I remember it was a few months later, probably like six to eight months later, we had gotten to the point where like, this is it. I, I, I listened to, a podcast that was the breakdown of all the polygamy stuff um, that went down. And I mean, I remember just sitting there thinking, this seems like sexual predator kind of stuff. Very, very much like um, manipulation and all the things that you would classify as a sexual predator. And I, Erica came home from work that day and I was like, I think I'm done. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Soon thereafter, we were like, Aren't we were like, we have to talk to the children about this. We can't keep this a secret anymore. So we gather all the children together and um, we were like, okay, so here's the deal. Here's what we're, we're going through, you know, but you can't say anything because dad still works at BYU Idaho and it's his job, but we're going to start trying to figure out a way to transition out of that job and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my son's first reaction was like, oh, thank goodness. And we were like, wait, why do you say thank goodness? He goes, I thought you guys were getting a divorce. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were like, oh. And then I was like, but wait, why would you think we're getting a divorce? Like, Eric and I like never argue about anything. He goes, you guys were constantly in your room, in the yurt, off by yourself, talking all the time. And you seem like you were always having these serious conversations. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, we were having serious conversations about where we were with the church, you know? And then my daughter's like, well, when can I start drinking coffee? <laughs> <laughs> nice. On to the important stuff. <laughs> yes, exactly. Here you are, you've deconstructed. You said you worked for the church for about a year after that point while you were trying to um, figure out a career post working for the LDS church. So what was that like in that year? What was it like navigating the system while feeling or being outside of it? Yeah. 
I am a very easygoing person. Like things don't really get to me. So I won't say that I was like, you know, stressing the entire time or I had this horrible time. I did feel like I was outside of my integrity, right? Um, because I was playing a part that wasn't true, right? And I, I knew that and I couldn't let that continue on for very long. Um, but, you know, like I went to therapy for a little while and I remember talking to my therapist about this very thing and she's not a member, but she was like, she looked at me and she goes, just so you know, I have lots of people in your situation <laughs> who work for BYU Idaho. And I was like, oh. <laughs> And I know like Erica's had several as well. And it's like, so it's not like, I'm not like some outsider there. There are people who continue to work there because that's their career, right? I mean, like they're a professor or whatever. And it's like changing now at age, whatever they are, you know, 50 or 60 is hard to do. And so they bide their time. But I was like, I I just can't continue to work here. The hard, The hardest thing for me was you know, going out and visiting high schools or doing presentations where I was like trying to promote something that I didn't really necessarily believe in anymore. Right. And and even then it was kind of muddy water because like, I feel like it's a good university. I mean, they give you a good education and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what was supporting it underneath the whole church thing was what I didn't believe in anymore. And so that was the hard thing, you know, and so where typically back in the, the old days, you know, you would sit there and you'd like, I, you know, I testify that there, the spirit is on campus and all that kind of stuff. Like I was no longer saying that stuff. I was, I was more along the lines of, well, you can come and have a great time. You know, there's other kids <laughs> <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, there definitely were moments where I was in meetings and different things where I had to like kind of bite my tongue and just be like, Ugh. I can't, I can't say what's really on my mind here. Um, but I, you know, for the most part, I loved the people I worked with. They were great. And I, and I still connect to them. I still stop by the office all the time and say hi to all these people. And, you know, my birthday was actually just a couple of days ago and all of them texted me on my birthday, just wish me happy birthday. So, I mean, they're fantastic people. I have nothing against them. It's just, it's the belief system that fell apart for me. So, so in that year, was your position, were you required to have a current temple recommend or was that not part of your, of, of uh, working in the admissions department? Yeah. So you're required to have a current temple recommend. Um, I never had during that entire year had to go in for a temple recommend interview. And <laughs> so, um, that was my way of saying that I wasn't like <laughs> totally <laughs> deceiving. Yeah, so you didn't have to go kind of go through that whole jumping through hoops to continue during that year. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And it was during COVID, so that might have made it a little bit easier too. Yeah, it was like the the deconstruction started during COVID, but where I was like I'm officially done with like the church, that was after COVID and it was kind of like towards the tail end of COVID for that year afterwards or so. I spoke with your wife, Erica, a little bit about this side as well, where you guys together started Greenstone Counseling out in Rexburg, and that's where you guys work together. What What are your roles within Greenstone Counseling? So she's obviously, you know, the counselor, and you guys have a, a number of employees, both in Rexburg and in Pocatello. Yeah, so she she's basically what they call the clinical director. And so she manages all the different therapists and making sure everything's on the up and up as far as the therapy goes. I handle all of the administrative stuff as far as insurance billing, uh, scheduling, uh, intake phone calls to get people on the calendars. So I pretty much do all the rest of it, which gets a little overwhelming at times. But um, but yeah, it's good now. Like it's, it's fun. So any listeners in the Rexburg Pocatello area, if you need counseling, go hit up Greenstone Counseling. Erica and Brady are awesome. <laughs> Well, I'll do another little plug at the end for you too. So <laughs> let's dive back into some of your duties while working in the administration department. You mentioned videos, brochures, social media presentations, and you're writing all of these and presenting them. Yeah. So when typically when I explain what I did for the university, I'll explain that I, I 
produced all the brochures and the videos and all that kind of stuff. But my real job was to try and get, you know, 50, 60 year old men to understand that they had no idea how to market to a high school student. <laughs> <laughs> so you're helping, helping these professors um, in their departments. So they weren't professors. This is a, it's like the, it's like the marketing arm of the university, right? Gotcha. Okay. And so they're like this one hub and they, they control the whole website. They control all the branding and yeah. And all of that other stuff. Right. And so other departments, so whether like records office or financial aid, if they need brochures, videos, or any of that kind of stuff produced, they go to them and then they work with them as a team and they will assign them a group of people to make that, that stuff for them. The only problem is, is that like, for me, I'm trying to market to a junior in high school, right? And the, the university is as conservative as can be, right? And so when I'm trying to produce a brochure that we take to a high school for a junior, and they're wanting it to look like the Enzyme or something like that, it's not something that a high school kid is like, wow, like sign me up, you know? Yeah. And so I was constantly the entire 11 years I was there trying to push the boundaries on what they would allow because it was like, this is the only font we will allow you to use. Like these are the only types of pictures you can use. And I remember specifically, I, at one point I wanted to put um, like a testimonial in the brochure, like a picture of a student and then have like a quote from them about why they chose to become to be or whatever it was, right? And I wanted that to look like it was a handwritten note in the thing, right? And so we had the students like write it out, but that wasn't approved because it wasn't an approved font. <laughs> so they had a guy in their department literally create a handwriting font that they can then approve <laughs> so then it could be in the brochure. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is like the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Like what uh, the man hours it took for him to create a font and like, I mean, that's only the tip of the iceberg. We, ha we had a picture once in one of these brochures and it was a, a picture of a girl doing intramural sports for BYU-Idaho in approved intramural shorts. But it was in the brochure and they were like, but you, we don't have, we don't allow shorts on campus. And I was like, yeah, but you do when they're playing intramurals, the shorts she's wearing literally have the BYU Idaho logo on them. And they were like, well, we can't, we can't let high school students see that because they might think that they can wear shorts on campus. <laughs> and I was like, what? Well, they can <laughs> when they're playing sports. <laughs> and they literally went on and edited the photo to put pants on her. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes. There was even, this one's even more crazy. <laughs> there was a video and there was a girl that we made. And in the video, there was a girl sitting in the gardens on campus reading her scriptures. So she's sitting on the ground with her back against a tree and her knees are or up against her and she, her scriptures are in her lap on her knees, right? And the, the, the camera pans along the side of her. Well, because she was sitting with her knees cocked up, her pants had kind of come up a little bit. And I'm telling you, like, it was just her ankles that were showing. And they made somebody go in and extend her pants in the video so that her ankles weren't showing. So frame by frame, editing the pants. Yes. That's incredible. <laughs> oh my goodness. Like that's the lengths that they went through. And I, we're, ta we're talking like 30 pictures a second that they're panning on this girl. To just like, to just not show her ankles. Like that. I, I, it's one, it's one thing on a brochure where it's like one photo, but yes. in a video, like that's insane. She was on the uh, she was on screen because it was like a bunch of cuts of different things. She was probably on screen for like one second, <laughs> and it was like nobody would have ever noticed it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you're talking about when you're saying like working with university relations and and making sure that all of these brochures that you're putting out are like approved according to what they how they want the university 
to be perceived. Perceived, yes, exactly. I'll add this, like this is a, kind of an interesting thing. Like I was constantly fighting for more of a like modern take on all that kind of more of a progressive kind of view on some of that stuff. And I remember that we one time we went down to church headquarters in Salt Lake City to see a presentation that and it was a presentation of a um, what do they call it like a research study that had been done by I think it was Deseret Digital Media and they had done it on behalf of I think it was the first presidency that they had done this and it was a multi-year um, study. And it was of the perceptions of the youth of the church. And this was one of the most fascinating things I'd ever sat through in my entire life. This guy, like they had literally traveled all over the world and all over the United States doing in-person interviews with youth of the church everywhere about their perceptions of the church. From anything to like your perceptions of your leaders here to like the church leaders to how the churches are set up and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of it was very much that like the youth did not like having interviews with bishops. They didn't (laughs) like how stuffy things were. They felt like they didn't, um, like they just didn't get them as youth was kind of like the overall gist of this thing. Right. And there was, there was so much to it. And I, I can't remember all of that kind of stuff. And I remember at the very end, the guy, he was like, now listen, he's like, this, this study is never going to be seen by the normal members of like the members of the church. This isn't going to be published. So you can't really talk to anybody about this. Um, and I mean, you can kind of mention it to people and things like that, but it's not like it's something they're ever going to be able to look up. And so it's just going to be your hearsay. And he goes, but if you want to know what the youth of the church really think about the, the church, he's like, it's all in this book. And he holds up a book. And the book was called New Copernicans. Oh, I have it written down. Let me, I'll find it for you. It's just so you can have it. Yeah, New Copernicans. Millennials and the Survival of the Church? Yes. So it's written by somebody, an evangelical Christian, right? And it's all about his, what he's learned about the youth and how they feel about evangelical church. And so this guy holds up the book and he's like, if you want to know what the LDS youth think about the church, it's exactly the same that's all written in this book. And I was like, I literally opened my phone and ordered the book. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. It came and I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, the church has got some issues on its hands if this is what the youth are thinking. One of the things that he really pointed out a lot was this idea that we try to teach the youth. Yeah, so in the book, he has this idea. One of them, he says... Much of our pedagogy is head, heart, or and hand, or observation, interpretation, and then application, when just the reverse is actually how we learn, which is hand, heart, and then head. And he was saying that the youth of the church are sick of being told what to do with it's, when it's supposed to be told to them and it's supposed to sink into their heart, and then, it, it, then it's their actions that are different. They like, in today's day and age, they want to experience it first with their hands, then that changes their heart, and then that changes their thinking, right? So it's the opposite direction. And he's like, the problem is, is that nowadays with social media and the internet and all that kind of stuff, they're able to experience everything. And they're able to see, like, when it comes to maybe even to social justices or the way transgender people are, they're seeing all that firsthand through like a more tangible experience and it's hitting their heart and it's their heart is saying to them um i feel like i kind of agree with this you know like they shouldn't be ostracized and demeaned and all that kind of stuff and then their thinking is completely different and they're getting a different message the opposite direction which isn't quite equating and so i thought that that was really fascinating going back to like applying that to the university, like I was sitting there the whole time and I was like, 
hello. Like, I mean, and the people from Muse Universal Relations, some of them were in that meeting. And I was like, do you not get that they don't want what you're giving to them in these brochures and in with even going back to the, the dress and grooming standards and all this kind of stuff? It's getting really hard for you to sell this place because you're not, you're not speaking their language, if that makes sense. Maybe you have uh, an eye in into this more than somebody else might working in the uh, administration department, but or, uh, admissions department, pardon me. Going to exactly what you were just saying, has there been a decline in admissions into BYU-Idaho and into the schools? Is that something that you're noticing? Like you're not communicating effectively to the youth, pulling them in? So th- that is a, a very good question. <laughs> it's very kind of complicated. So here's here's the breakdown of it. When I first started working at the university, um, BYU-Idaho admits around 96% of the people who apply, Right. So we're admitting everybody, basically. And the, really, the only people who aren't getting admitted is like, if for some reason your bishop is like, do not endorse, which is pretty rare because typically the bishop's going to be like telling the kid that and the kid's not going to be then applying. Why would a bishop say do not in- endorse? Well, some bishops are afraid to say in the, because they're supposed to be in, all the applicants are supposed to be interviewed by a bishop and stake president, right? And so the bishop for some reason, doesn't tell this kid, uh, well, you're not worthy to attend, so I'm not going to endorse you. They don't say that, but then they mark it on the application. <laughs> and so we're like denying some kid and he's like, I, why am I being denied it? I have like, I have like a 3.8 GPA, <laughs> like what's going on? And it doesn't take long for them to figure out that it's either the bishop or a seminary teacher that said something. So gotcha. Yeah. So we're admitting most of the people who apply. Now, Back, we have three semesters, and and that's what really allows us to admit that many people is because they can break it up. You're assigned to a fall winter track, winter spring track, or a spring fall track, and so we're able to admit thousands of more students because we have more semesters and we uh, we assign them to those semesters. Now, when I first started to to be able to attend on your off semester was not something that really happened at all, right? But over time, we started, and we never had any projections. We were never told once, this is the number of applicants you need to get. Then over time, all of a sudden, we were being told, well, you can let people override for their off semesters. Uh, a few people here and there, you know. Like it's, it's not that big of a deal. You can let a few here um, attend in their off semester. Um and then we were all of a sudden being told, well, here's how many applicants you need to get for each application cycle. And we were like, oh, okay. And then it started to progress to like, okay, well, we don't have enough students who have registered right now for this upcoming fall. So we want you to send out an email to every current student who has 60 credits or and above, offering them a, an override to attend their off semester. And, and then that even progressed to like, well, here's your numbers. You have to hit these numbers for applications and also send out an email to every single student because we don't have enough people registering so we can get enough people here. At the same time, the university reports its numbers, right? And every single fall semester, you get this report. We have more students than we've ever had. We have more students than before and all this kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there in my office thinking, Well, yeah, you do, but a ton of them are on overrides. So that's why you have all these students. So are they getting double counted then or? Well, no, that's how many students are attending during that fall semester. But where before we were just counting the students in that were assigned to the fall semester. Now it's like we're counting all the students that were assigned to fall semester, but all these students that have overrides as well. And plus, where before we would hit, like, so the application deadline, say, was August. Because we really didn't have an application deadline. We would just let people apply up until when school started. And so we needed to hit that application deadline by August, right? The first few times we had these application deadlines, we were hitting it months in advance. Then it was two months in advance, then one month in advance. By the time I was leaving, 
there were times where we were cutting it pretty close to the beginning of the semester where we were hitting those projected targets. Now, those projected targets were an increase above the previous year. Um, but it was getting harder and harder where before we would never have to do anything really to kind of like recruit. It was now like we were sending out emails all the time to any kid who had like showed any interest. We were like talking to bishops. We were talking to seminary teachers. We were talking to counselors all the time. And it was getting harder and harder to kind of more recruit where before is more like public relations kind of really. Were they expecting like growth? Like was that they wanted to grow the student base within the school? Yeah, I they they did. And they had like a certain target I think that they were trying to hit eventually over the years. But to be completely honest, I don't know how they were getting these numbers. Nobody ever explained it to us. Especially when we were going to different meetings down at church headquarters with seminary and institutes. And seminary and institutes was like, Oh, have you guys seen these charts? The youth of the church is like dive bombing like there's not as many youth in the church coming up in the next couple of years it's going to hit a cliff and also the number of students registering for seminary is dive bombing <laughs> so oh wow and so we're getting all these things from seminary and institutes telling us that the numbers are going to like just dropping off off these cliffs yet our projections are getting higher and higher and higher and i'm like well are they take are they taking that into account? I didn't know. Like, because it seems like we should be like looking at those numbers and saying, okay, well, we might have a harder time meeting these numbers because there's not that many youth in the church. So to answer your question, it's like, yes and no, they are getting more students, but it's getting harder, I think, to convince them to come sometimes. If you want, I can tell you about a whole survey we did with students about that. I would love to, but let me ask this question real quick, and maybe this will tie into your survey. Just from the perspective, at least within the culture of the LDS church, is that, you know, option one is BYU. Option two, if you can't get BYU, is to go to BYU-Idaho. Was that part of this difficulty of filling the school? Is that there's maybe less youth applying and they're go- they're getting their first option because maybe less competition to get into BYU. And then then you're, you're getting a smaller overflow, if you will. And then, you know, maybe a second half of the question Were there difficulties in promoting BYU-Idaho as a first choice for students over a BYU? Yeah. So to your first question, I don't necessarily know if we were losing out any students to... Well, yeah, we were obviously losing out students to BYU, but it wasn't like they were admitting more students and taking those away from us. So I don't think that that was necessarily the case. Um, They they kind of admitted around, I would say 56% of the people who applied to them. So they, they denied a ton, a ton of people. And yes, we got a lot of their overflow that would come to us, but we also didn't, there was a lot of them that were like, uh, that's, that's beneath me. I'm going, I'm going somewhere else. Um, to your second question, like how was it to promote BYU Idaho? Like, I feel like, yeah, there was, there was a bit of difficulty over the years. It got a little harder. I, I felt like, I mean, this is all just my, my personal opinion to this, but we did, we did these surveys at one point where we were trying to find out why students weren't applying to us, right? We wanted to just know that information, like why an LDS student wouldn't apply to BYU-Idaho. So we, we devised this whole plan, me and my boss, to go out and do in-person surveys at seminary buildings. And what we did is we took um, a list of seminary registered students in that geographical location, right? So say it was somewhere near Boise, which we did several of them in Boise. And we then found the students in that school, and we compared that to which students applied and which students didn't. And so we, we went to the seminary teacher and we said, here is a whole list of students. And we didn't really even tell the seminary teachers what we were, why we were doing this. But we were like, out of this list, I want you to pick 20 students that you think are great, great seminary students, right? So that seminary teacher then is picking 20 of, off this list of these great students that did not apply to, to us. 
We then asked him to ask those students to that there was a an organization, not BYU, Idaho, an organization coming to do a survey with them, and they would feed them pizza during lunch, and they were just going to ask a bunch of questions. So we went in dressed in normal clothes <laughs> so that they wouldn't know that we were like some, I don't know, like BYU, Idaho <laughs> person. <laughs> And we would conduct these surveys, and it wasn't like we initially just dove into, why didn't you apply to BYU-Idaho? It was, hey, what are you guys thinking about higher education? Have you applied to any schools? What schools have you applied to? Why did you apply to those schools? Have you ever heard of the church schools? You guys are all LDS. Have, did you apply? And why didn't you apply to BYU? So we naturally led them into, why have you not applied to BYU-Idaho? And at this point, they have no clue who we are and why we're asking these questions. And the questions, once again, it was much like going to that thing down at church headquarters. (laughs) They, I mean, there were some kids and they articulated their answers very well. I remember one kid was like, I am a faithful believing member of the church. I just don't want to be told what I can't and can't wear and how I need to behave. And so... I'm going to go to a university where I will still be an active member, but I can be me. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was in the background just like, yay! (laughs) (laughs) And that was one of the overall majority of them, uh, of the responses was like the dress and grooming standards, which I was like, oh my gosh, if you guys just allowed people to grow beards and wear shorts, you could like have so many more people coming to your university. Um, there were a lot of people with the perception that it was like a second rate university, that it wasn't a real degree that you were getting from there, which really isn't true. I mean, we have, I mean, I know many professors, a good friend of mine who teaches in at and phys and stuff, and they're sending people to the Mayo clinic to become doctors and things like that. So it's not a second rate university by any means. Um, But a lot of it is just a perception that they've heard about BYU-Idaho being this just second-rate school with super strict rules, and it's no fun to be at. There's almost a pride from someone who graduated BYU when they talk about BYU-Idaho. It's typically that they'll talk down on people that didn't get to BYU, and like that's why they went to BYU-Idaho. And there's, there's almost a subculture within the LDS church where they would judge anyone who doesn't get to the main church school. There is definitely a belief within the church that it is second rate, whether that's true or not. It's, it's something that's per- perpetuated by a lot of those that did go to the church school. Yeah. And the, here's the funny thing. Cause I, you'd get that comment a lot when you'd go out um, on the road and you'd have a parent come up to you and say like, why should my kid go to your school and over BYU or whatever, you know? And the number one school that is transferring to BYU, Idaho, is BYU students. Oh, interesting. The number one school transferring into BYU is BYU, Idaho students. So we're each each other's number one transfers back and forth. You have students that might not get into BYU and they come to BYU for a few semesters and then they transfer into BYU. You have, including several people who worked for me, who went to BYU didn't like it and came to BYU Auto and said that it was way more fun. And, and so I would always tell people, it's a matter of what you're looking for. Like if you're looking for a program that's top ranked, yeah, BYU has some of those. But if you're going to go get a degree in English, you might have just as good an experience and just as good an outcome coming to BYU Auto as you do BYU. Great professors. And really, a lot of students that I talked to who left BYU just said that it was like nobody was having any fun is what that's what they told me at least was that it was like everybody was studying it was so hard to like appease your professors it was hard to get good grades and you just had no free time and then when they came to BYU it was like oh I can breathe there's more of this culture of like you know helping each other out and you know your professors are definitely more willing to like help you pass the class at least that's what I was told. So. so my wife was one of those that she was accepted to both BYU and BYU-Idaho. And she chose BYU-Idaho because Idaho was giving her a full ride scholarship. Yeah, that's another <laughs> thing. It's like, well, and I, I was in a meeting once with President Iring where he, he was like, 
why would some kid want some kid who is the valedictorian of his school, the smartest kid in his school, goes to BYU and all of a sudden is the dumbest kid in his class? Why would you, <laughs> why would you want that when you could then come to BYU Idaho and be one of the top kids in your class? Your professor loves you. You get a scholarship. Your professor's like, oh my gosh, I am. I have this connection with a company down in you know Chicago, and I can get you set up with this amazing job. Where and then you're at BYU, and you're like, yeah, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a great conversation. I love some of the things that we've touched on. We have a, a bit more to get through on the outline. So if you're okay with it, I'd love to bring you back on next week. We'll continue this discussion, and we'll go into a little bit more of like the leadership and the organization within the tr- within BYU Idaho, and we'll discuss some of your observations there. Was there anything else that you wanted to say, maybe final comments on what we've discussed so far about working within the admissions department, maybe the honor code or anything that we've touched before we wrap things up for this episode? No, I think I'm good. I, you know, obviously with the caveat, this is my experience. I can't like, can't like project this onto anybody else or anything like that, but yeah, I'm, I'm good. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Brady. And again, for the listeners, you can find them if you're looking for for therapy or counseling out in the Rexburg or the Pocatello area, Greenstone Counseling, go reach out to them and support them in their business. We're looking forward to having you back on the show next week, and we will continue from where we left off. Thanks, Brady. Thanks, Scott. Next week, I'll bring Brady back on. We'll continue our discussion about the inner workings of the BYU-Idaho Admissions Department and what it's like being an employee for the LDS Church. If you live in the Rexburg or Pocatello area and you're in need of counseling, be sure to check out Greenstone Counseling. Be sure to support both Brady and Erica. So come back next week. We'll continue this discussion. But until then, wherever you find yourself out there, Just starting your workday, opening up that email inbox where the sheer number of messages gives you just a little bit of anxiety. You got this. Just breathe in and out a little. And I hope you have an excellent day.